Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. I've been talking to you about the similarities and differences between the instruments, the woodwind instruments. And what I want to start off today is about the mouthpieces of the saxophone and the clarinet. Now, this is not a class on, on, uh, on clarinets and saxophones, but most of the time when I talk to you about mouthpieces, I talk to you about mouthpieces that do not have a reed, like the recorders and the penny whistles and the flutophones, they don't have a reed to them. And so I decided that I'll just, uh, just for your own education, talk to you about mouthpieces that do have a reed. This is a clarinet mouthpiece. I don't know if you can get a, a good close-up view or not. That's, I guess, pretty good. Yeah, that's really good. And as you can see, there is a hole a hole in the center. If I put it like that, I think you can see it because the light bounces off from it. So that's just a, a kind of an empty space. If you look at it the other way, this is a, a space you can see through it. So it just has this opening, two openings. This opening here attaches itself to the instrument, whether it's clarinet, sax, whatever it happens to be. And you, it has cork on it, and you would put some cork grease on it so it would be able to be moved easily. And then you'd have to be putting a reed on. Now I'm going to show you how to do that, but I want to talk to you about three different kinds of reeds. The saxophone and the clarinet uses reeds, and they can come in different strengths, different thicknesses, made of different things. The reeds that most people use if they're professional is going to be the cane reed. Now the cane reed is made out of cane, it's a wood, and uh, you can see that it's thicker on one end than it is on the other. This is the tip of it, and this is a vibrating reed. If you were able to get close enough, and I don't think you're going to be able to do it, but that's a really good shot right there, you would look at it and you would see it's a little lighter color on top, and gradually it gets a little thicker and a little darker. Not much, just a tiny bit. I can see it from here because I'm holding it. I guess you can see it a little bit. And now these reeds are fairly expensive, but they're the best reeds you can get. And most people play them. Professional people use, uh, use these kinds of reeds. And they can be, this one I think is, a, this is a Rico and it's a V two and a half. If you are able to see the backside, it's labeled how stiff it is. And it goes from one to about four or five, even maybe up to six. And the softer it is, the lower the number is, the softer it is, the easier it is to get it to vibrate. Most students will start off with about a number two. They won't go any higher than that because then it's so stiff and hard that it's hard to make vibrate and your lips usually aren't strong enough to do it. So this is a cane reed. And if you get, you can usually buy them in boxes of about 25 or so. And usually you go through them and you see that that's a very even way of gradually thickening. If there's a little blotch or something and it's not an even way of getting a little thicker and a little darker, then the reed may not be very good. You can get a box of reeds, and some of them probably won't be very good. The vast majority should be okay. And the, as I said, the lower the number, the softer the reed, the easier it is to vibrate. Now, another kind of reed, I'll show you how to put it on in just a minute. Another kind of reed is a plastic coated reed, and it's black. The whole side, the whole back side is black. And on the front side, it's black up to the point of where you put it on the instrument. Now, I like these reeds, and usually if I'm going to get a box of reeds, this is what I'm going to get. The advantage of using a plastic coated reed is that it's an actual reed, but it's covered with plastic, so you don't have to keep it moist. On a reed like this, a cane reed like this, you have to keep it in your mouth, you have to keep it moist. You have to make sure it's moist before you play, because if you don't, it's going to squeak, it's, it's going to squeal on you. So it's not unusual in a concert to see people who are musicians who are playing in an orchestra walk around with reeds in their mouth. 
And the idea is to keep it moist so that it won't squeal. With these, you don't have to worry about it because they will automatically play. Put them in your mouth and they're all set to go. So you don't have to moisten them. If you are playing oboe and bassoon, and I don't have those reeds with me. They're a double reeded instrument. Oboes and bassoons are double reeded, so they have two reeds, and they vibrate off each other. It's as if I had two of these, and they were one was you know, a little lower than this, and they were just vibrating off from each other. But they actually carry around bottles of water, and they stick their reeds, because they have to be very moist. And you, you, you know, they put their, their reeds in a bottle of water, and if they're between songs, they take off the mouthpiece, put the mouthpiece in the water so the reeds will be in the water, so to keep them continually moist. Or if they're playing and it's intermission time, they make sure they have their bottles of water that they put their reeds in, so when they get back to the concert hall, when they start playing again, that they won't have to worry about it, the reeds will be normally wet enough. But this you don't have to worry about. The plastic coated reeds, put them in your mouth, play them. They play very well, they play easily. I don't sit around soaking reeds in my mouth all the time if I'm doing a concert or something like that. But you need to see this. Now there is one more kind of reed that I want to talk to you about, and this is a berry reed, B-A-R-I, berry. It's plastic all the way through it's plastic. You can practically, well, it's kind of translucent. You can't see through it, but it's obvious that it's plastic. Put it in front of my sweater here so you can see it. Well, whatever, there, you can see it right there. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of a berry reed. The uh, plastic reeds, I had one that was white and it lasted me for years. They're practically indestructible. You can play them. You don't have to moisten them. They don't have to be wet. You put them in your mouth and you play, but they don't have a lot of flexibility, and as a result of that, they're hard to play. And sometimes it's hard to get a good pitch, especially on higher notes, because you've really got to force it because it is totally plastic. Its advantage is that it's not going to chip, it's not going to crack, and you don't have to worry about that. You can play it as soon as you put it in your mouth. The difficulty is it's, it tends to be hard to play. You have to really kind of use your lips. They have a phrase called lipping it up. In other words, it means forcing it with squeezing your lips a little tighter to get it to play a little higher. They do work, they do work well, but they're just hard to play. And I want to mention a uh, cane reed Usually, uh, you can play a cane reed for about 25 hours. It usually has a limit. They will crack. They will split, especially with kids who don't know how to handle them. They're always biting them or doing something or banging them up against something, and they crack and they chip, and then you can't play with them, so they're constantly having to change reeds. The value of having a plastic-coated reed is the fact that it's a little harder to crack. But you've got to remember, if you're playing a woodwind instrument, and the instrument is um, uh, not a flute, so it does have a reed, that if a, a beginning player is going to be using a lot of reeds, you know, they're going to be chipping them, or they're going to be hitting up against them, or they're going to be splitting them. And sometimes you can get away with playing them if they have a little chip in them, but not for very long. They don't sound good, it'll get worse, and so forth. So you have to think in terms of how many reeds you're going to have to buy, because after a while it gets a little expensive. So if I'm teaching a child, watch the reed, don't bang the reed, put the reed in your mouth, don't knock it up against your teeth. There are all kinds of things that will, will destroy your reed. And even if you take care of a reed and you do a good job in taking care of a reed, at the end of about 25 hours of playing, it's pretty much had it and you need to have another reed. So anyone who's doing professional work, they carry boxes of reeds with them because not every reed in a box is a good one. Most of them will be, but some of them won't be. So how do you put this together? Well, here is the mouthpiece. I have a black coated reed, a plastic coated reed on this mouthpiece, and so I'm gonna take it off. And this little metal place, this little metal part that you put on the reed is called the ligature. 
and it screws in. Now, usually it has two screws like this one does. Occasionally you can get a mouthpiece that has a ligature with only one screw. I don't like them very much. There's not so much flexibility. But I'm going to take it off just by unscrewing it and slipping it out from the top like I'm doing now. I have to be careful because I don't want to bang the reed. And then you have your mouthpiece. To put it back on, you would uh, take the ligature off. Now you have the plain mouthpiece. Put the flat side against the mouthpiece in position. Normally, uh, the top of the, you can see the top of the reed is curved a little. It will match the curve on the mouthpiece, or it should. And then you put it up so the curve is, is about right. Then you take the ligature, and one side of it is wider than the other side because it's got to match the, the, um, the uh, mouthpiece. You take the wider side, and you put it on over the top gently, and slide it down, and then you position everything in place, because it won't be in place exactly. I have to wiggle it up. I wished I could turn it around, but if I did, I wouldn't be able to do it. And you'll find, once you get it in place, <clears throat> a little bit of that white piece shows from the reed. So you know you've got it in position, and just screw it in. Once you have it screwed in fairly tight, not terribly, terribly tight, once you have it screwed in tight, un unscrew a little bit. Take the top screw and pull it back a little as if you were unscrewing it. And the reason for doing that, you don't have to do it very much, but just a little bit. That allows the reed to vibrate. It's more free to vibrate if it's not terribly, terribly tight on top. It has to be tight enough to hold it, but just unscrew it a tiny bit, and then it'll just loosen it up enough to give it more chance to, uh, to vibrate. And that's all there is to it. Um, I, I, I need to move this ligature a little bit. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm not playing it just to get it exactly. If your reed is too soft and it it's, uh, needs to be tighter, it needs to be a little stiffer, you can always take the top part of the reed and push it up a little bit more so it's a little bit above rather than below the or, or even with the top of the mouthpiece. Um, if it is too stiff and you're having a hard time playing it, you can make it a little softer by bringing it down a little so it's not exactly at the top, but it's down a little. You can also take a razor blade and you can shave it a little bit if it's too stiff, and that will loosen it up and make it a little softer too. I know I've had a lot of reeds where it's a little bit too stiff and I start shaving the bottom to get it so it's more even. So there are a lot of things you can do. So if I'm to show you this, I'm not going to put a ligature on this, but just to show you, if, the, if, the, um, if it's a little bit too soft, bring the top of it up. I don't know if you can see that or not. In other words, it's not exactly at the top. It's up a little bit. That automatically stiffens it a little. It makes it a little harder to play. If it is too hard to play, draw it down a little bit. And when you've done that, uh, it makes it a little softer. If you need to, take it off and take a razor blade and shave it a little on this side, not the flat side, but the other side that's sticking out and that will help to make it softer. And that's how you handle it. Now, why do I want you to know this? Most of the, the, the what I'm teaching you, the instruments don't have reeds. Uh, recorders, flutophones, sasuto flutes, penny whistles, um, song flutes, tonettes, they don't have uh, reeds, but a lot of the woodwinds do. A lot of pl people that play the instruments that I'm teaching in here also play saxophones and clarinets and flutes. Now the flute, I didn't bring one in, but you don't have a reed either. But if it's like a fife or something, you would hold it up and you would blow across it. Uh, however, I don't have one with me, but you would hold it up like this and just blow it across, and there's no reed involved. There are some people who play flutes 
because they don't have to bother with reeds. But reeds are important because they do vibrate and they do cause sounds, especially in the saxophones, clarinets, and the oboes and the bassoons. If I had an oboe or a bassoon, I'd bring in the double reeds, but I don't have one. I have played them. However, I played everything that's a woodwind. So I'm going to go on and talk to you a little bit about differences in the instruments that in the fingering positions, I, it's a, almost a little too late for me to start something new. But, but if you take an instrument such as a recorder, the fingering patterns of the recorder, B, A, G, F, E, D, that's about the same as it is in other woodwinds instruments. There's a remarkable similarity between the instruments, the woodwind instruments, and the way that they play. For the most part, with the ones that I'm teaching you, uh, they don't have reeds, so we don't have to worry about that. But the fingering patterns are a lot the same. If you were playing a saxophone, then you would play C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C. Since we're playing a recorder, what's the same fingering pattern? C, A, B, you know, C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C. On the flute, the only difference would be the C. The C is like, is like a, a, a different kind of, of uh, fingering like that. But it's very similar. B, A, G, F, E, D, C is the same on the flute as it is on the saxophone, as it is on the recorder. The C is a little bit different on the flute, but they're basically the same. So it is possible to transfer what you know from one instrument and transfer it to another instrument if it's a woodwind. Now, I can't speak about the bass, uh, about the uh, brass, because that may be different, like the trumpet has your three valve system. I don't know if it's the same as there are some trombones that have a valve system, although most of them use a slide. So you're going to find more variation, I think, with the brass than you do with the woodwinds. But the woodwinds are about the same. So what, and I'm not going to start it now because we're almost out of time, but what I'm going to do is to go through all of the woodwind instruments, the uh, sasutos, tonets, song flutes, flutophones, and show you the fingering pattern and show you the different kinds of mouthpieces that they have. They're very, very similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're close. Like, for example, if I take my penny whistle, which I brought in, and I take my recorder, you can tell just by looking at the two of them how similar they really are. Uh, there's a little different shape. There's a little difference in the block, and, but basically they're the same. You blow into them, they have a labium in the front, they both have that labium. Uh, the uh, recorder has a block in the back, you don't see it in the penny whistle. There's a diff they're made about the same. They sound a little different, and the reason they're going to sound different is that their ranges are different, and what they're made of is different. The penny whistle is made out of brass. It's a metal with a plastic, uh, a plastic mouthpiece. The uh, recorders are going to be made out of plastic or wood. And there's a little difference in the tonal quality between a plastic and a wood. So I'll just try that. We're kind of running out of time. But let me try, try the, um, the wooden one. This is a German Sonata. I've had it in here before. Now, if I do about the same thing with my Yamaha, it's going to sound about the same, but maybe not a little bit brasher. Now, those octaves that I did, I did completely 
with my thumb hole, just bringing my thumb down a little so that it's not exactly covering, but close to covering, and it's gonna bounce a note up an octave. Now, it doesn't work with every single note, but it works with quite a few notes. And in the woodwinds, like saxophones and clarinets, you usually have a key back here. You press the key, and it bounces a note up an octave. So it's kind of the same principle. The only one that's, that's different would be the clarinet. When you press an octave mechanism for a clarinet, you don't get an octave, you get an octave plus five other notes. So that the fingering pattern for the clarinet is different. You, with the clarinet, you have two separate fingering patterns, one for the upper register and one for the lower register. So if you go from a lower register to the higher register on the same note, you have a completely different fingering that you have to have, as well as using the octave mechanism or the higher register octa uh, mechanism. Well, I'm going to close it here because I don't want to start something that I can't finish. We're going to go on next time and talk about the differences and similarities on the instruments that do not have reeds, the non-reeded instruments. I have a lot of pictures of, to show you of that. And then after that, uh, we'll go into some other things, how the instruments are made and uh, take, it off, take off from there, then go back into fingering patterns and play some numbers. So this has basically been teaching to show you the construction of instruments and how they work. So I'm going to close it here. Please join me next time.